So this will be our first video for audition, which is the sense of hearing, the auditory sense. We'll first discuss some basic psychophysics of audition. Then we'll see how sound is transduced by our ears and where it goes in the brain. We'll also talk about damage to the auditory system and then spend some time on how we localize where sounds are coming from. And finally, how we accomplish hearing in complex situations and environments. But first, I want to start us off with a classic riddle as posed in a classic TV show. Bart, I have a riddle for you. What's the sound of one hand clapping? Pizza cake. No, Bart, it's a 3,000 year old riddle with no answer. It's supposed to clear your mind of conscious thought. No answer? Lisa, listen up. Ugh, let's try another one. If a tree falls in the woods and no one's around, does it make a sound? Absolutely. <coughs> but Bart, how can sound exist if there's no one there to hear it? Ooh. <laughs> so if a tree falls in the forest and no one is around to hear it, does it make a sound? I'm going to argue that the riddle is much less confusing if we address it from the perspective of psychophysics. So... All we really need to do is distinguish sound in the physics sense of the word from sound in the perceptual sense of the word. Physically, sound, or we might say sound waves, are, are just pressure changes propagated as a wave through a medium like air or water. On the other hand, sound is a perceptual phenomenon. That is, when we're hearing something, that's an experience we have when those pressure changes stimulate our auditory system and are processed in our brain. In other words, we need to distinguish sound waves from what something sounds like, specifically what it sounds like to a particular person when it's processed in their particular brain. So let's start here in this video by clarifying what we mean by the physical sound wave, and then we'll get into the perceptual stuff that's more interesting for psychology. So the waves of sound we're talking about here are patterns of vibration. Specifically, it's alternating patterns of high and low pressure, kind of high or low density in a, in a specific place, like there in the air. Now, the speed depends on what medium is being vibrated. So it is different in different things. For example, sound is around four and a half times faster in water than it is in air. Now, note that sound waves are really not sending molecules from the source to your ear. When someone talks, it's not a bunch of molecules coming out of their mouth and those molecules actually end up in your ear and end up in the ears of everyone else who hears it. That's not really, there's not really a substance being moved. Rather, the molecules are vibrating in place without actually moving to a new location. They just bump into their neighbors and say, pass it on. And the next molecule bumps into its neighbor and says, pass it on. And the next one bumps into its neighbor and says, pass it on. And repeats this potentially many, many times per second, even hundreds or thousands of times per second. So it's the energy, the pattern of vibration, that energy is transported without actually transporting physical matter. Now, you'll often see graphs of sound waves that have these curves, like you can kind of see at the top of the, the graph in the upper right here, uh, where it has like a sine wave pattern going up and down. That doesn't mean molecules are vibrating up and down. Look at the actual labels on this, on this graph, on this depiction. Note that the y-axis along the side there, that's air pressure. And then the x-axis along the bottom, that's time. So you can see here, time is going right from left to right. That's time. And so we're saying across this amount of time, whatever this is, whether it's one second or a fraction of a second, across that amount of time, the pressure in the place we're looking at, the pressure somewhere in space or wherever our measuring device is or wherever our ear is, the pressure is getting high and then low in that amount of time. And this will repeat in cycles. So over a certain amount of time, the pressure in a given place in the air, it's cycling from high pressure to low pressure, often a bunch of times per second. The molecules are not jiggling up and down. That's not what the graph shows. The molecules don't get pushed to new locations. They're vibrating in place, just sort of back and forth, away from and back toward the sound source. And we're just graphing here how much and how fast they're getting squished together in a given bit of air. So how much and how quickly the pressure is changing from high to low over and over again in a cycle. Here's another depiction of that. It's, it's kind of showing what would happen uh, if you zoomed in at the molecules right next to a tuning fork. 
So you may have seen a tuning fork before. It's this piece of metal. You kind of hit it against something and it'll vibrate and it'll make a sound at a particular frequency. So this tuning fork, if you hit it and it starts vibrating, let's say it 200 hertz or whatever, 200 times per second. So it's just vibrating back and forth. A little piece of metal is going left, right, left, right, left, right. You can kind of follow it through time here at different time stamps. You can say the metal was vibrated to the right and then it bounced back to the left and then went to the right and went to the left. And that's what's happening is it's just vibrating in place there. Well, what, what it's doing to the molecules nearby and how it's going to transmit that information, transmit that wave of sound towards, you know, an ear that's across the room is as that in the first time point as that piece of metal moves to the right what it's going to do is squish together just push together some of those molecules that were already there next to it in space just floating in the air next to it so it squishes them together a little bit it compresses them makes a little higher air pressure a little higher density here at time point one and notice it hasn't yet affected any molecules further away that's going to take some time but as we go to time point two what happens is that little bit of metal it vibrates back to the left, right? Because it's going to jiggle left, right, left, right, left, right. As it goes back to the left, what's going to happen is now those molecules that it hit a second ago are pushing on their purple neighbors off to the right. So they've bounced a little bit off to the right. And these ones here now have some space to spread out because the piece of metal has gone back to the left. So now those red molecules actually are lower pressure, lower density where they're at. But again, we've squished the purple ones because of that, that red ones bounced against them a moment ago. So they're temporarily squished together in higher density, higher pressure. We still haven't affected the ones in C and D off to the right here. But at time point three, uh, just a fraction of a second later, that piece of metal is now bounced back again. And it's again squishing those initial red molecules. So they're going to go high pressure, high density again, and they'll start bouncing against the purple ones. But now temporarily, the purple ones are all spread out, right? Because we actually, you know, we're able to push back against the, the red on the left here. And they're also pushing against the red on the right here a second ago. So they're in a temporary state of low pressure, low density, but they've now started pressuring, kind of pushing against their neighbors right a second ago they pushed against the red neighbors here which are now high pressure high density and you can see we basically get at any given place whether we're looking at the purple place or the red place any of these places what we're going to get is a, a back and forth a cycling of high pressure to low pressure but that doesn't mean an individual molecule like this red one here is going to end up over here at the edge or further along in the room landing in your ear the molecules don't move they just pass the information along, pass it on. Now, there are two important physical aspects to a sound wave that we really need to understand in order to understand why we perceive what we do when the sound wave hits our ears. So there are two parts of a sound wave we care about that are gonna affect what we experience or what we perceive. The first of those is frequency. Frequency is the number of cycles per second, right? I said these waves cycle. They go sort of up and back down or up, down, and then back to where they started. That's a cycle. So a frequency is how many cycles happen in a given second, how many times it flips from high pressure to low pressure in a given bit of air over that amount of time. You can see what I mean on this picture to the right at the bottom here. Uh, so high frequency means in a given amount of time. So here we've got just a hundredth of a second, a fraction of a second. But high frequency, you can notice it goes through this cycle of up, down, up, down, up, down, a bunch of times in that hundredth of a second. So it's a higher frequency than what we get at the bottom of this graph here. A low frequency says in that same amount of time, a hundredth of a second, we might only have about two of those cycles, right? So low frequency means the cycle repeats much less in a given amount of time. So the frequency is actually the primary determinant of the what we experience as pitch. So high frequency sounds are perceived by us as high pitch and low frequency sounds are perceived as low pitch. So when someone talks about having like a high voice, a squeaky voice, right? Or a low voice, a low sound, that's from high frequency sound waves or low frequency sound waves. And then we perceive it as those high or low sounds, okay? Now we measure frequency with hertz, big H, little z, hertz, where one hertz is defined as one cycle per second. And that means like 75 cycles per second, we would call 75 hertz. If it bounces back and forth, right, it goes high pressure, low pressure, 200 times per second, that would be 200 hertz. So 
what is the frequency, just to kind of feel this out, what's the frequency of the bottom wave here in the graph? I suggest you take a moment, pause, and try and figure it out. Okay, I'll give you a hint. It does the, the repeat, it does the cycle two times, right, up and down two times in a hundredth of a second. So in a full second, it'd be a hundred times as much. So in a full second, it'd be two times a hundred, which is 200 hertz. So what we're saying is if we actually calculate this out, we'd say uh, this particular kind of low frequency sound wave, that would be 200 hertz. It's cycling 200 times in a full second. So that's how we convert it to hertz. Now, we humans perceive from about 20 hertz at the lowest to 20,000 20, hertz at the highest. I'm going to stop trying to make those stupid noises. But 20 hertz is so low you could barely detect it, like the rumble of a far-off elephant or something like that. Whereas 20,000 hertz is so incredibly high-pitched it's approaching like a dog whistle where you can't even hear it. In fact, as people get into their 20s and 30s, and especially older than that, uh, they'll actually have trouble hearing those highest frequencies. We lose our high frequency hearing mostly uh, over time. Now, the other aspect of a physical sound wave that we care about, that's important for us to understand how we experience the perceived sound, would be uh, the amplitude of the sound wave. So amplitude is the difference between the highest and the lowest pressure levels. In other words, on the graph, it's how tall the the curve gets how tall and then how far down it goes so how far away from zero the pressure gets like the the change in pressure how big it is that's amplitude because remember on the y-axis here that's air pressure from low to high so is it going through a cycle from high to low the question is just how high and how low does it get each time each cycle if there's not much of a change each cycle then that's low amplitude if we perceive that or we would you know perceive that as a quiet sound on the other hand if there's a big change each cycle that's a big amplitude of the sound wave so showing us taller waves here on the graph and that's what we would perceive as a very loud sound so amplitude is going to be the main determinant of loudness though as we'll see other things can affect the perceived loudness but amplitude is the main thing so as a sort of simple heuristic remembering amplitude equals loudness would be a good start now you'll usually see amplitude measured in decibels little d big b decibels and you can see some examples on the right here so for example we at, at about zero decibels is is the threshold of human hearing it's where we can just barely maybe detect something Whereas 20 decibels would be leaves rustling, 40 might be a quiet community. Usually if people are speaking at their normal voice, it's about 60 decibels. Uh, as we jump up, we're missing 80 here, right? But as we jump up to 100 decibels, you're talking like a subway train or 120 is a, a you know smaller plane taking off. A jet engine might be closer to 140, at which point you're barely even hearing. It's more just like you're experiencing a lot of pain from that sound if you're close enough to it. So... Uh, what I want to, to point out there, though here, now that we have kind of a feel for different decibels, is decibels is actually uh, on a logarithmic scale. If you don't know what that means, don't worry too much about it, but it means each jump up in decibels is not a linear increase in the actual sound pressure out there, the actual amplitude. Rather, every 20 decibels means 10 times more sound pressure, 10 times more amplitude. So one jump of 20 decibels is 10 times more pressure, no big deal, but four jumps of 20 decibels isn't 40 times more pressure, rather it's 10,000 times more pressure. So don't treat every decibel increase on your stereo as equal. A jump of you know 20 decibels can mean a very different thing. Um, it's you know 10 times, but as you go 10 times, 10 times, 10 times, you quickly get up to something that might be, you know, a million times louder, even though it seems like all you've done is, you know, turn it up a few steps. Okay, so now that we understand those two important aspects of the physical sound wave, right, where frequency is largely going to give us our perceptual experience of pitch and amplitude is largely going to give us our perceptual experience of loudness let's dive into some of the nitty-gritty de details of how we perceive sound so the perceptual side of sound the loudness and the pitch and other things let's start with loudness first i told you amplitude is the main determinant of loudness but the relationship is actually a little bit different for different frequencies so the pattern still holds more amplitude will always be more loudness 
at a given frequency, but we'll see that part of the determinant of how loud we experience something is the frequency that, that we're talking about. So there's a little nuance there where frequency will also impact loudness sort of indirectly. To understand that, let's look at this graph I've got here on the right. We're gonna look at fo these four colored lines separately. So let's start, let's just start with the green line. Looking at the green line, what we've got here on the bottom of the graph is frequency, right? And on the left side of the graph here is decibels. So what we want to, or what the, what the green line is telling us, what the green line is saying is how many decibels a sound has to be for us to hear it at all. So we've labeled this the threshold of hearing. This is a curve for uh, like how, how many decibels something has to be, the amplitude has to have for us to be able to say, oh yes, I heard that. And what you'll notice is the absolute threshold for hearing is different at each of the frequencies. So for very low frequencies, we need a lot of decibels to hear it, right? It's pretty, the green is pretty high up. You have to be like 60 plus decibels before you can even hear a sound when it's down at 20 hertz. But at around 2000 to you know 4000 or 5000 hertz, we can pick it up with very few decibels of, of pressure. Look where they've labeled A and B here on the graph, right? A 40 decibel sound, it's going to be heard if it's at 100 frequencies, but if it's at a lower, like 25 hertz frequency, we won't actually hear it. So we don't just say 40 decibels is enough for us to hear it. It depends on the frequency. That's why it's important to take this little bit of nuance into account. Now, let's move from that green line. Let's actually go to the top of the graph and look at the blue line up there at the top. At each frequency, this line is telling us when we start feeling discomfort most of the time. So the threshold of feeling is basically the point at which instead of just hearing the sound, we actually start sort of feeling discomfort from the sound. Generally above about 120 decibels, it's so loud, there's so much sound pressure in the wave that we soon start feeling pain as much as hearing anything else. But no, that in some places it does take less than 120 decibels to get to that point. So again, the frequency matters for the loudness we experience. Now, what about these red lines here? Let's start with the top red line. Every point on this top red line is perceived as equal loudness. Everywhere on that line is perceived as being just as loud as a 1000 Hertz tone at 80 decibels of sound pressure. So 1000 Hertz at 80 decibels of sound pressure, that's right here. That's gonna be perceived as the same loudness as a lower pitch sound at 80 decibels, but it's gonna be perceived as the same loudness as a much lower pitch sound at say 90 decibels. But also that's the same loudness as a higher pitch sound at less than 80 decibels. All of those different sounds would be perceived as the same loudness to us even though there's different decibels here, different amounts of the actual amplitude, but our perception takes into account some of that frequency information, right? Um, so uh, 100 decibels at 15,000 hertz might sound the same loudness as 75 decibels of conversation, even though it's more than 10 times as much air pressure. So that top red line, um, that's an example of what we'd call an equal loudness curve because every point on it is perceived as being the same loudness. We're experiencing it as the same loudness. Now, the bottom red line, that would just be another equal loudness curve. Actually, there would be you know hundreds or thousands. You could fill in this whole graph with just a bunch of red lines. Those would be all the equal loudness curves where different sounds are felt or perceived as being the same loudness. Everywhere on this bottom red line sounds the same loudness as a 1000 hertz tone at 40 decibels, for example. So where we've got C labeled, that's 1000 hertz sound at 40 decibels, but that means it's the exact same as, as you know, what we've labeled point D here. Point D, 20 decibels more, it's 10 times more sound pressure, right? Every 20 decibel step is 10 times more sound pressure. And yet we're gonna hear it as the same loudness, perceive it as the same loudness, despite 10 times more pressure going to our ear, right? And if that was enough pressure, it'd be 10 times more damage to our ears. And yet we're going to perceive it as the same loudness just because it's at a different frequency. So big picture lesson here. At any given frequency, amplitude is what determines loudness. So amplitude, like higher amplitude, will always be higher loudness for a given frequency. But don't assume, you know, a given amplitude or a given decibels will always have exactly the same perceived loudness because we pick up some frequencies easier than others. 
So just as a side note here to think about and kind of preview some later stuff, based on what we can see here, what frequencies do humans seem to hear the easiest? Well, it'd be where the graph dips, right? And you can see it kind of consistently dips in a, in a particular place. In other words, where it takes fewer decibels, less amplitude, to get the same perceived loudness. And here you can see it dips at around 2,000 to, we'll say 4,000 or 5,000 hertz. Turns out those frequencies are actually the ones that are crucial for understanding speech. And we'll come back to that later. Now, I mentioned pitch, so that was loudness. I mentioned pitch is what we experience for different frequencies. So amplitude gives us loudness, uh, frequencies give us pitch. Pitch is, you could say, sort of the perceptual quality that we describe as high sounds or low sounds, that we experience as high or low. And it's usually represented on a scale, like with music, right? Though voices also have pitch. Now, pitch is closely related to the physical frequency of the sound wave, but it's not exactly the same thing as we're going to see. And two people may hear slightly different pitches from the same physical note. So uh, I do want to point out, I've got this kind of depiction here. As we move up a piano, note that the tones get higher in frequency. So you can kind of see the frequency at the top here. Tones get higher in frequency, and that means they're they're perceived higher in pitch. So you play things further on the right, it'll it'll sound higher pitched. Uh, tones at a certain distance, uh, what we call an octave apart, we've kind of highlighted them here in orange. Those are actually perceived as similar. When we play a 27.5 hertz sound versus a 110 hertz sound or a 440 or 880, those are perceived as the same note. It's just a higher pitched version of that note. So there's something we might say fundamentally similar between an A1 and an A2 and an A3, even though each one of those is higher pitched as we go up higher frequency, perceived as higher pitch. This is another way to, to visualize what I'm referring to. Different versions of the same note, like a F1 or an F2 that are one octave apart, or an F1 and an F4 that are three octaves apart, they're sometimes said to have the same chroma, but there's, there's something we experience similar about them. They're the same note. So regardless, the important thing to get here is that, that higher up, means it's a higher frequency note and thus will, will sound higher pitched to us. That's the basic relationship of frequency to pitch. Higher frequency experiences higher pitch. But we've got this interesting repeating pattern at each octave that we need to explain, like why there's a similarity between each of the E's or a similarity between each of the C's. Why do we hear that even though it's a higher frequency? It's a different sound, right? A higher frequency sound, but there's something similar about them. And we'll come back to that. We'll get to that in a moment. Now, here we've got a depiction of, to kind of get a feel of the, the frequency range of various common instruments. Some of which you can see have a pretty modest range, like the tuba there near the bottom. The, the tuba can really only play mostly low notes, low frequencies, while others have a wider range, like the harp, which can play notes, you know, they're both low and high in pitch. And of course, the piano at the bottom here, you can see has a pretty vast range of frequencies that it can output. Now, the examples so far, I've just talked about pure tones, which are those nice, simple sine wave patterns like this. They all just go this nice up down sine wave pattern. And turns out like pure tones are pretty rare in nature. Uh, whistling is kind of close to that tuning forks like we saw before. Those actually output pretty close to a pure tone. And a lot of research in psychology is done with pure tones. But let's talk about what hits our ears more commonly. Like when someone is singing or we're listening to a guitar play a note, those aren't pure tones. We actually call them complex tones. So complex tones like a guitar note or a piano note are actually made up of a bunch of pure tones added together. And then the interference between those tones, the way that they combine together, like a bunch of sine wave, pure tones, like we see B through E here, they combine together and make this more funky looking combo of sound, but it's not a perfect sine wave, right? That's why we call it a complex tone. It does repeat itself in cycles, so it still is similar to those sounds we saw before. So look at the complex tone at the top of this graph, the one in purple labeled A. It's a, it's a funky looking pattern, but note that it does repeat in a cycle. In this case, it happens four times. We can see the whole cycle here repeats four times in 20 milliseconds, 20 thousandths of a second. 
So four times every 20 milliseconds, if you actually run the calculations again, that would mean 200 times every second, every full second, it happens 200 times that this, this pattern of funky sound repeats or hits our ear 200 times per second. The same vibrational cycle is occurring 200 times per second, so it's 200 hertz. Now, what we see in B through E here, the, the bottom parts of this graph are four complex tone components, or sorry, four pure tone components, four, four pure tones that make up that complex tone. So one pure tone is at say 200 hertz, that's B here in red, and we've kind of labeled it the 200 mark just so we can keep track of that. The second one here, C, that's at 400 hertz in green, and then there's one at 600 hertz, at 800 hertz, and so on. So that's, that's the idea of a complex tone is we can kind of measure for this thing that's repeating 200 times per second, this funky complex pattern, what's happening is a combo of all these different sounds are part of it. So we actually, we could do a frequency analysis with a, you know, a, a computer, a microphone, and pick up and see that sounds are coming in at all these different sounds at the same time, making up that one complex tone, like that, that note from a, you know, a guitar or a piano. So let's see an example. In this, in this video, she's going to play first a pure tone. She's just going to play a plain, simple, pure tone at 1000 hertz. In other words, it'd be one kilohertz, right? So it's actually going to be labeled here on the graph at 1K. You'll see a sound show up at 1K for 1000. And you can see if you look at the labels here for the different frequencies, right? It goes down to 20 because that's the lowest humans can hear. It goes up to 20K or 20,000 hertz because that's the highest humans can hear. But she's got it labeled here with 1,000. Here's 2,000. Here's a little jump to 5,000. Right? It's not a per, it's not to scale. Right? It's gonna it's gonna start shoving things together as we get to these higher frequencies. But but labeled at different frequencies here. So let's watch the video. What I want you to do is watch her play that pure tone at 1,000 hertz, and then compare what you see down at the bottom when she has a piano play a complex tone. Okay, so this tutorial is to show you the difference between a pure versus a complex tone in frequency analysis. So first I'm going to play for you a sine wave and I'm going to let you look at what it looks like on the EQ screen with the analyzer. Okay, so you can see that when you listen to a sine wave, it is just one frequency. And in this case, this is a 1000 hertz frequency. Now, if I go into a different instrument, um, such as, let me go into the pianos first. Go to the piano and the Steinway. I'm going to put the analyzer on, and I'm going to play the same tone. I'm going to show my keyboard here quick. All right, so the tone that you heard was 1000 hertz, which is about a B4. That's this tone. And as you can see, This tone has several frequencies present. Specifically, 1000 hertz is the lowest of them, but then it has a bunch of other ones as well. So that's an example of a complex tone. So okay, again, complex cool. tones are something that we we you know hear a lot more in reality. We don't hear pure tones all the time. What we hear are complex tones made up of a bunch of pure tones when we're listening to, to music or voices or things like that. What I want to point out here again is where we had that pattern initially for the pure tone at 1000 hertz. When she did that complex tone, playing the same note, but from something more complex like coming out of an instrument, what we get is sound at 1000 hertz, but notice where the other sounds are occurring. They're all occurring at multiples of 1000. So there's sound at 1000 hertz, but there's also sound at 2000 hertz. And if up here is 5000 hertz, then this must be 3,000 and 4,000, right? 5,000 hertz, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10,000. There's sound at 11, 12, and so on. At all of the places where there's sound coming out, there are multiples of this bottom, I'd say sort of fundamental or bass frequency of 1,000 hertz. So when she played that note, that 1,000 hertz kind of note, in this case, the complex tone is made up of 1,000 plus things that are multiples or steps up of 1,000 from that. So let's go back to this earlier example where we saw this graph on the right. The complex tone at the top in A, that repeats 200 times per second, 200 hertz. This is called the fundamental frequency of that complex tone, that complex sound. So the repeat of that whole combined tone that many times per second, we'll call that the fundamental frequency. And everything 
is that's part of that has kind of that same spacing. So if the fundamental frequency is 200 hertz, then every sound, every pure tone that's part of it will be steps of 200 above that. So all of the pure tones that we see here that make it up, those are multiples of that. You 200, 400, 600, and 800. And we have a term for that. We call those harmonics. Each of those, those component parts are called harmonics of that combined or complex tone. So the first one, the one that's actually what the fundamental frequency would be, so 200 hertz, that first bit at 200, that would be the first harmonic. And then this next one at 400 would be the second harmonic, and the third one, the third harmonic, and so on. And even though we don't have sound coming out at 1000 hertz in this particular complex thing, we would still say the fifth harmonic would be 1000 hertz. The sixth harmonic would be 1200 hertz, and so on. Everything, all those harmonics, they're just a multiple of that fundamental frequency. The fundamental frequency is the same thing as the first harmonic. It's that everything is just like a step up of that, in this case, 200 hertz, whatever the fundamental was. Now, it's actually interesting, removing one or more of those harmonics doesn't actually change the fundamental frequency. So we'll actually still hear it as the same note. In this case, if you take one of these pieces out, like we've done at the bottom here, we've taken out the first harmonic, just meaning there's no sound there. There's no sound actually coming out at 200 hertz, but everything else still has a spacing of 200 hertz, still it goes steps of 200 hertz. So it still has the same fundamental frequency because 200 is still the spacing between those harmonics. That's what determines the fundamental frequency. That's what determines the note that we hear. So even if the fundamental itself doesn't have any sound, like on that bottom graph, the fundamental frequency would still be 200 hertz here, because that's the spacing. Likewise, if we had sound at, let's just say, we had sound at 200, 400, 600, and then nothing, nothing, and then maybe some sound at 1200, the smallest common spacing there is still 200 hertz. That's the smallest spacing between any point. So that sound would also have a fundamental frequency of 200 hertz, and it would sound like the same note to us, but there'd be, there'd be kind of a different quality to it, but we'd still call it the same note. It would just have sounded a different combination of those harmonics. So if there's a different combo of harmonics present or absent, we actually will perceive it as the same note, but it'll have a different quality to it, something different about it. So we all know this experience because we've all heard a bunch of different instruments play the exact same note. Here on the right, depicted on the right here, we've got three instruments, guitar, a bassoon, and an alto saxophone, all playing the same note. So here, all the sounds are, are coming out at various frequencies when, when these instruments play the same note, which in this case has a fundamental frequency of 196 hertz. Note how the guitar has a lot going, up, going on, um, in, up in some of those higher frequencies, right? It has a lot going on at some of those higher harmonics, those higher steps or multiples of 196 hertz, right? But the volume is kind of low there, right? Not much amplitude coming out at those higher ones. And then, you know, the bassoon is, is pumping out the most volume at some lower frequencies, but it's got some sound coming out higher up too, whereas the alto sax doesn't actually have any really high pitch sounds coming out, any high frequencies coming out. It's got kind of a, a spread lower, lower. So alto sax is a little lower frequencies in general, get emphasized. Each of these instruments here is playing the same note. It's, it's going to sound different to us. We can tell the difference between a guitar playing that note and a saxophone playing that note, obviously. But that's weird because we're getting some sort of pattern or information here beyond just individual frequencies, right? Different sounds are hitting our ears, and yet we still can recognize it's the same note being played by those two. So what is that, that quality that, that we perceive that, that makes a guitar sound different than a bassoon, different than an alto, even if they're at the same fundamental frequency, even if they're playing the same note? We call that quality, that perceived experience, that perceived quality, we call it timbre. And yes, I know it has an eye, it looks like timbre. If you wanna call it timbre, that's fine, but it's technically pronounced timbre. And I wanna, I wanna kind of show you an example of this. So let's see what we're talking about here with a video. You're gonna see a bunch of instruments playing the same note. In other words, they'll all have the same fundamental frequency. They'll all be multiples of 128 hertz. And you'll see where the sound comes out. They're gonna graph where the sound comes out, have all the different frequencies, but I want you to look and see at the, at the spacing and notice all these different instruments will have the same spacing between the harmonics, 
but we might see a different harmonic structure, a different set of which harmonics are present or absent, or which harmonics are, are getting a lot of volume or not much. So let's play this out. I think I'll start with a piano here playing a note. So let me pause for a second just so we see what we're seeing here. On the left side, he's put the frequencies. So we've got down from very low, like 70 hertz. Here's where they're playing at 128 hertz. That's the fundamental frequency, right? Sort of the base note, the base of the note that they're playing. But that fundamental frequency of 128 hertz, that's one place where the sound is. And they've shown a lot of sound coming out. This is just the amplitude, how wide it is. It's just the amplitude. But it's centered. The actual sound is only coming out at 128 hertz here. But there's also sound coming out at another 128 above that, so 256. And then another step of 128, there's some sound coming out. And then another step up at 512, there's some sound coming out. Another 128, and so on. All of these are multiples of that. So now let's look at, again, we'll compare this first sound. That's a grand piano, and then you'll see some other instruments. guitar a sitar notice a lot more sounds up in those higher frequency range a viola cello all still just multiples of 128 really gets up there. All right, so th those are examples of timbre. Timbre we could define as the harmonic structure of a tone. This is what lets us distinguish tones even when they have the same loudness, the same pitch, and the same duration. So for example, uh, a flute, right? A flute has a sound that we might describe as some quality that we, we say flute is kind of a clear sound, whereas an oboe's sound is sometimes described as a, a more reedy sound. Or someone might be described as having like a nasally voice, whereas someone else has a more mellow voice. Those are, are timbre. Timbre is the, the sort of quality, the harmonic structure that comes out. So the, the same fundamental frequency might have different harmonics that are present or absent or different harmonics that are strong or weak and that's what changes the timbre that we experience now there are other bits that that we could dive into like um, attack and decay build up and decrease of a note things like that don't worry about that unless you're into music or musicology but just fundamentally here what we care about is that harmonic structure is is how our brain or it's kind of what our brain is picking up on that then we experience as the timbre now what I want to note is as we go up an octave, so again, that step we've highlighted in, in orange here, that step up from an A1 to an A2, up to an A4 or whatever, as we go up an octave, it actually doubles the fundamental frequency. So an A0 is at 27.5 hertz, but an A1 is double that, 55. And an A2 is double the 55. And an A3 is double that at 220, and then A4 is 440, and so on. It's the same note name at each of those doublings of fundamental frequency, just a higher pitched version of it. So let's actually stop for a moment here and check for understanding with a couple examples. So first, let's say we combined, I don't know, 2000 hertz, 4000 hertz, 6000 hertz, and 8000 hertz into a complex tone. The question I might ask you is, what is the fundamental frequency there? And, and could you list the harmonics? Or... The second question, let's say we combine 400 hertz, 500 hertz, 600 hertz into a complex wave, a complex tone. What's the fundamental frequency there? And can you list the harmonics? I suggest you pause the video here and try and answer these yourself before moving on. 
Okay, so the first one has a spacing of 2000 hertz between those component tones. So we know that the fundamental frequency is going to be 2000 hertz. That will also then always be the first harmonic, whether they're sound added or not. So even if 2000 wasn't part of the sound we were hearing here, even if 2000 wasn't included in our list, we would still say that the fundamental frequency is 2000. We'd still say the first harmonic is 2000. It just you know wouldn't be there in that case. Here it is, so we do say the first harmonic is present, the fundamental of 2000, that's there. And then the second harmonic is a step of 2000 above that at 4000, third harmonic at 6000 and so on. Even though we don't have anything up at 10,000, that would be the fifth harmonic. We don't have anything at 12,000, but that'd be the sixth harmonic and so on. Okay, what about the second question? The fundamental here, the fundamental frequency is 100 hertz because that's the spacing between them, right? Even though there's no sound at 100 hertz in this tone, so the fundamental is missing, the first harmonic isn't there. In fact, the first, second, and third harmonics are not present. There's no sound coming out at them. We're just getting sound at the fourth harmonic. 400 hertz would be the fourth harmonic, and we're getting sound at the fifth and sixth harmonic, 500 hertz and 600 hertz, but still the fundamental frequency is 100 hertz. Okay, here's one more example just to really kind of hammer it home. So in this case, it's a clarinet playing an A note where the fundamental frequency is 880 hertz. So 880, that's the fundamental frequency of this note. The sound wave on the left here, this is what actually enters your ear. It's a complex sound wave. It's not one of those beautiful little sine waves, right? It's a complex combo of a bunch of sounds. That's the stuff that hits your ear when you hear a clarinet playing an 880 hertz tone. You'll see the actual combined sound there on the left, but we've pulled out all the harmonics on the right that went into that, including the fundamental frequency there in red, that's the first harmonic, and then on the right, all the others, sometimes called overtones, just all those other harmonics beyond the first. On the graph at the bottom, so the bottom of the screen, we're just, we're just showing each of those pieces to tell you what frequencies sound is coming out at. So you can see the basic spacing here is 880 hertz, again, even if one or more of those bars was missing, it would still be a, a fundamental frequency, a basic spacing of 880. In this case, they've drawn the height of each bar to give you its amplitude too. In other words, how loud that component is. But yeah, the, the clarinet is giving us uh, you know, the most amplitude here at the lower frequency bits and quieter for those higher frequency bits. And that's, that's part of what makes a, a clarinet have the, the timbre, the, the quality that a clarinet does have is how much it emphasizes certain of those harmonics when playing a given note like 880 frequencies, right? And we see the same thing in that top graph here on the right. It's just how tall or not that each of these cycles go. That's how much amplitude, how much emphasis there is on like these lower frequencies, the, the earlier harmonics versus the, the higher up later harmonics, the higher frequencies, there's not as much amplitude. They, the curves don't go as high. That means, right, there's, there's sort of less volume at those parts. Now, we've been talking about periodic sounds, which are you know, repeating waves of a given frequency. But there are also aperiodic or non-repeating sounds, like a door slam doesn't have cycling like we've talked about, doesn't have those, those repeating cycles. Talking actually doesn't, uh, it's more aperiodic, uh, radio static and some other things. So these are still generally complex and, and they can be analyzed into simpler frequencies, um, but don't worry about that for now. We'll, we'll come back to this when we learn about speech perception, but for now our next video is just going to look at how transduction occurs for our auditory sense. In other words, how we start to turn these physical sound waves into neurons fire.